I want to talk to you this morning. As a matter of fact, I changed the direction that I was going because of something that came up in my devotions this week and some of the conversations that I've had with people. And I have been really living in the book of Job and in the book of Jeremiah because we have some families in our church, some people I know in our community that are really suffering. They're going through some very difficult and hard times. Some of it's physical, some of it's emotional, some of it's relational, some of it's psychological. All of it is a spiritual battle that people are having. And as I've just been living with the book of Job and the book of Jeremiah, I was talking to one of my brother-in-laws the other day, and he goes, oh, I can't hardly stand to read Jeremiah. He says, when it comes up on my annual Bible reading, I just go ahead and read it as fast as I can and get it over with. And I'm sure that there's some people feel that way about the book of Leviticus or something like that, but I, I've really been living in this book. And I have to tell you, I'm finding such great encouragement in Jeremiah. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, and in the story of Job, recently in a movie, I I heard Job referred to, and fortunately, it was referred to in the right way of how that God pulled Job through his sufferings, and it wasn't an attack on God, it wasn't an attack on Christianity, and, you know, it wasn't a Christian movie, it was just a movie about God pulling people through, and I I thought, it's so easy for us in the midst of a battle, emotionally, spiritually, physically, psychologically, it's so easy for us to lose focus that God's going to pull you through. One of the families in our congregation told me this week, they say, Pastor, and they're going through a difficult time, a difficult time physically, and said to me, Pastor, we find ourselves saying all the time something that you say at church, if you can stand the pulling, God will pull you through. Will you say that with me this morning? If you can stand the pulling, God will pull you through. So I was reading the book of Jeremiah where God called Jeremiah to take a stand. Now, God has called every one of us in this room to take a stand. God has called you watching online, our online campus, and those of you that are watching perhaps later, He's called you to take a stand. Take a stand for God. Take a stand for righteousness. Take a stand for justice. Take a stand for loving people. And in Jeremiah's standing for the Lord and being faithful, he became persecuted. And Jesus told us that if we take a stand for him, if we follow him, that we're going to suffer persecution. So Jeremiah is rejected. He's turned upon Job's friends rejected him in a sense. They turned upon him. And maybe you've been at that place in life where you've taken a stand for the Lord and people have rejected you. Following Jesus is kind of like a magnet. You know, a magnet has an attraction quality, but it also has a repelling quality as well. There's some things that uh, when magnets are turned, it will repel things rather than attract things. Following Jesus is a lot like that. There are some people that are attracted by the goodness of God, the love of Jesus, the grace of God, the miracles of God. But then there are other people that are repelled by the message to take up your cross and follow me. They're repelled by the call of God for us to to live as passionate followers of Christ. Not to live for ourselves, but to live for God's glory. Sometimes that even happens in the church. Sometimes people even in the church will repel one another because they don't like each other. And that shouldn't happen, but it does happen. I don't want you to raise your hands, but if you're like the first service this morning, people were grinning when I said this. How many of you know Christians that you you love them, but you don't personally like hanging out with them, you know? So don't raise your hands, but in here there are people nodding and grinning this morning. But we don't want to do what people in the world do where they become passive aggressive and we just write them off or we reject them because in our hearts we become cold towards them. We want to keep warm and tender hearts. Well, the Apostle Paul was rejected as well in his ministry. There was not only the world that rejected the Apostle Paul, but there were some in the church that rejected the Apostle Paul. There were some that didn't like his message, and Paul would even write, some of these folks are preaching Christ 
to spite me. Some of these folks are preaching Christ because they're trying to cause me trouble and cause me grief. But what do I care? Christ is being preached. And may that never be true of any of us. May we always preach and bear witness to Christ faithfully. And whether we happen to like or dislike some people, may we always love one another as passionate followers of Christ should do so. Can you say amen? There is a little saying that's true, and I've heard it ever since I was a child. I have no idea where it comes from. I've never bothered to look it up, but it occurred to me after the first service this morning. Oh, to dwell with saints above, but what a different story to dwell with saints below, you know? Heaven's going to be wonderful, but sometimes it can be a challenge living together. And God told Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 20, when Jeremiah was rejected, God told him, he says, Jeremiah, I'm going to stand with you. And God tells the Apostle Paul the same thing. Would you stand with me out of respect for the word of the Lord if you're able? As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. Now, don't miss that. My life has already been poured out as an offering to God. I want you to get that. Because that drink offering that was poured out, that's what he's referring to. His congregation would have known that. It looks like it was wasted. Somebody had gathered the grapes. Somebody had crushed the grapes. Somebody had vented them and then bottled them or put them in the wine bags. And then they take it and they just pour it out as an offering to God. It's kind of like when David's men went and got him some water from the well of Bethlehem And he said, they risked their lives to bring this to me. I can't drink it. And so he poured it out as an offering to the Lord. It looks like a waste. And Paul says, my life may look like Pastor Tim. He's writing to a young Pastor Timothy. He says, my life may look like it's been wasted. My life may may look like it's meaningless, but it's been poured out as an offering to God. I have lived my life for the glory of God. I don't care if my life is measured by the success of men, by the success of the world. I have lived my life as a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. So don't miss that. Capture what he's saying. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have remained faithful. Would you say that with me? I have remained faithful faithful. Say it again. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Now we're skipping down a few verses. The first time I was bought before the judge, no one came with me. Now notice that. No one came with me, And everyone abandoned me. Have you ever felt like that? Where you were standing alone. And then Paul makes this very powerful statement. May it not be counted against them. I don't know if you've ever been completely abandoned. I don't know if you've ever been completely rejected. Especially in the most difficult season of your life. I know people like that. Let's pray what Paul prayed. May it not be counted against them. But, this is big right here. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength. Say that with me. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety For the Gentiles to hear. And he rescued me from certain death. And yes, the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, I ask you in the next few minutes that you would just speak to our hearts. Make this real to us this morning, I pray. Help us to be willing to stand alone if necessary. But may we never forget that the Lord stands with us. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. As a little boy and as a teenager being often in the hospital, 
I can remember as far back to the kind of beds, rails that they would raise up around you that had the bars on them so that you, as a child or you wouldn't roll out of the bed or something. But week after week of being in the hospital, my mother and dad would remind me that Jesus was with me. They would remind me that even though I couldn't see him, that he and the angels were with me. I took great comfort in that as a child. I was able to envision Jesus being in that room with me as a child. It was, it was not a difficult thing for me to envision God's presence being with me. And I think that's one of the things as I read these scriptures that you and I have to recognize. We have to envision God's presence with us this morning. And as we envision God's presence, we not only imagine, we not only dream, but then we confess the reality that what we're envisioning it is true. The Lord has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. Now, look right here for just a moment. Jesus is with us in this church this morning. We are gathered in his name and we are gathered in his presence. Christ himself is with us. Can we welcome Jesus to Woodland Church this morning? Can we just say, Lord, welcome. Welcome into this place. Welcome into this room. Welcome into my heart. Welcome into my family's life. Recently, I was at a meeting, and, and sometimes I just want to do things to make people think. And I was at a meeting in our community, uh, one of our township meetings, and somebody walked up to me and says, Pastor, how is your church doing? I go, I don't have a church. They go, oh, you've retired already. And I go, oh, no, I've not retired. I'm still the pastor of Woodland Church, but it, it's not my church. He goes, well, who does it belong to? I go, Jesus. Oh, oh, I guess you're right. And I just I said, I know I'm right. It's, it's Jesus' church. I said, I have preached in a lot of churches. I've preached in churches all over the world. I have never seen a church I wanted to own. Sometimes I feel like Moses. These are your people, God. You called me here. These are your people. Of course, he's laughing, and, but I think he got it. It's, this is his church, and he is here with us the way I look forward to my kids coming home for Christmas and gathering them around the, the dinner table and the tree and celebrating. Envision the presence of God with you. Never forget this verse in 2 Timothy 4, 17. The Lord stood with me, gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear. If we don't remember that the Lord is with us, then we can hesitate upon the fullness of the message. We can hesitate upon declaring all that God's Word says. Are we a church that is concerned about justice? Yes. Are we a church that is concerned about feeding the hungry? Yes. Are we a church that is concerned about seeing people get a good education? Yes. Are we a church that's concerned about peace? Yes. Are we a church that's concerned about Bible teaching? Yes. But we are also a church that believes that all people must come to God through faith in Jesus Christ in order to be saved and born again. We cannot leave that part of the message out. We must preach the whole gospel. And so what Paul preached, it did include peace. It did include feeding the hungry. It did include seeing that people had what they need. But he was always faithful to the message. The center of all he preached, he said, was the cross of Jesus Christ. And why the cross? Because through faith in him who gave his life for us on the cross and died for our sins, was raised again on the third day, and is coming again, we can be saved. And so we envision the presence of God with us even when people reject. Most people won't reject you for peace. Most people won't reject you for feeding the hungry. Most people won't reject you for being concerned about somebody else getting an education. But the moment you preach Jesus in his fullness, then you run the risk of being rejected. And that's what Paul was saying. I envision God's presence. The second thing I take from the scripture that I want to live like Paul did was live fearlessly. Don't let the enemy somehow or another make a coward out of you. Don't let the enemy make you timid. He would also write these words to young Pastor Tim. He would say, Tim, look at me now. Look at, don't miss this. 
He'd say, Rich. He'd say, Debbie. He'd say, Amy. God did not give you a spirit of timidity, but he gave you a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind or self-control. That's what God gave you. You're not crazy for believing in Jesus. You're not crazy for believing that Jesus is coming again. So don't back down off of any part of the message, but instead press forward with the call of God. Now, Paul, like Peter, wrestled with something that most of us in this room don't have to wrestle with. We know he wrestled with it because he talks about it frankly in this passage and that is that everybody abandoned him I've tried to put myself in that place I know what it is to be mocked I know what it is to be laughed at I know what it means to be beaten up because of your witness for Christ I I can tell you those things I know what it means to be uh, to have suffered those things but I've never suffered what Paul suffered And Paul, in his abandonment, he has this marvelous way of still loving God and loving people. He doesn't become bitter. He becomes better. He doesn't become weaker. He becomes more powerful. He doesn't become timid. He becomes bolder. As a matter of fact, if you can imagine, the apostle Paul says, pray for me that I will boldly preach the gospel. I mean, that was his foremost concern and yet as someone that has been preaching the gospel for 50 years how often I've seen people who've been hurt who've been abandoned who've been wounded they can't let it go they're obsessed with the past the past has a hold on them and rather than learning the lessons from the past they become captive to the past When God wants us to learn the lessons from our past so that we can move forward into our future. Please hear me this morning. God is more interested in your future than he is in your past. What's in your past is in your past. It's what's in your future that really matters to God. But so many people, they live with anger. They live with regret. Maybe they failed somebody else. They don't know how to lay it down. They rehash it over and over I recently prayed with someone, and I have permission to share this, and someone right here at the altar, and he says, Pastor, I just don't know how to let it go. I'm obsessing over it all the time. I I keep rehashing it. I I go, oh, it, it comes up in my dreams. It comes up in my thought life. I'm just driving down the road, and it comes up. Pastor, how do you let it go? All of us have had those things happen in our life. The story is told of two Buddhist monks Buddhist monks are taught they should never look at a woman, nor should they ever touch a woman. So these two monks are on a journey to their monastery, and as they're on their way to the monastery, they come to a a river that is now a rushing torrent that normally they can cross, but the, the rains have come, and there's dangerous currents there, and there's a beautiful Japanese girl in her kimono standing there at the river's edge. She's obviously afraid, and so the one monk says, may I help you? And she says, I need to cross the river, but I'm afraid because of the swift currents. And he says, I'll carry you. So he reaches down and scoops her up in his arms, and he carries her safely to the other side. And there he sets her down. That night they get to the monastery, and his, his friend, the other monk, said to him, he says, I have a bone to pick with you. As Buddhist monks, we took a vow to never look at a woman, to never touch a woman, and yet you did both today. And his friend looked at him and said, look, I set her down on the bank of the river, and you're still carrying her in your mind. And I think so often, instead of being able to lay something on the altar and leave it there, we carry these things in our mind. I have memories as a child in church on Sunday nights. One of the favorite songs that our pastor wanted to lead us in as he called people to the altar to pray was leave it there, leave it there. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. 
Sometimes people bring their burden to the altar, and rather than leave it there, they pray about it, and then they pick it up and say, I'm going to take this home with me. No, there's a message in that song. Leave it there. Leave it with God. You see, if not, then we start living in fear of people, what they may do to us, what they may say about us, maybe trying to please people like some politicians who refuse to be statesmen or stateswomen and do the right thing even though it might cost them of the election. That's what I love about statesmen and stateswomen. They'll do the right thing. It might cost them an election, but they will do the right thing. They'll abide by the Constitution. They will obey the law. They'll protect human life, both pre-born and born life. They'll protect the elderly. They will stand by the Constitution, but then there are others They're going to do whatever the polls say. And so if it's popular to butcher a child's gender identity, if it's popular to destroy marriage and the sanctity of marriage, if it's popular to do something, then they do what the polls say. But polls are like people. They're persnickety. Look at your neighbor and say, sometimes you can be persnickety. You see, people are fickle. Ed, did you tell your wife that sometimes she can be persnickety? All right, I just want to be sure you were manning up back there. You see, nobody likes to be told we're fickle. Nobody likes to be told we're persnickety. But that's what people are. And if you live in fear, the Bible says this in Proverbs 29, 25, fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. Read that with me. Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. People will let you down, but don't ever take it personally. People will let you down, but don't ever take it personally. Jesus said in John 15 and verse 18, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. People will let you down, but forgive them. Verse 16, Paul says, everyone abandoned me. But he then goes on in verse 16 to say, may it not be counted against them. See, Pastor, how do I forgive? The same way you bring something to the altar, you leave it with God. If I take this iPad, and I won't lift it high, but if I take this iPad and I drop it, That's what it means to forgive. When I say, God, I'm not going to hold this grudge. I'm going to forgive. Now, understand what I'm saying. When you forgive people, you still got to learn the past lessons. You got to learn what led up to it. I mean, when you forgive someone then it's the obligation of the person who hurt you, maybe lied about you, gossiped about you, betrayed you. When you forgive them, you've got to, they've got to rebuild trust. And trust building takes time. You can spend a lifetime building up integrity, but you can throw it away in just a few moments. And if that person betrays you again, then don't turn around and let them hurt you again. Forgive them again, but don't put yourself in a position where they can hurt you again. John Claypool from Birmingham, Alabama. John's a pastor. He, his grandfather's pear tree was blown down in a tornado. John says this pear tree was a real family marker for us. It had been on the farm for years and generations. He says, my grandfather had played in the pear tree when he was a boy. He said, I played in the pear tree when I was a boy. He said, we all kind of grieved when the pear tree was, was, was blown down. We had eaten its fruit. We had made pear relish out of it. It was delicious. And you've never lived until you've had pear relish. And I'll just throw that in there. That won't cost you anything. But pear relish with peas and butter beans, oh, my goodness, that's such good eating. But back to the sermon this morning. The tree burnt down, and a neighbor came over to John's grandfather and says, John, what are you going to do? He says, well, I'm going to gather the fruit, and then I'm going to burn what's left. There was another sacrifice in the Bible called the burnt offering. 
for that offering was totally consumed as a sacrifice to the Lord. There's a lot to learn from when people abandon you. Gather the fruit. Learn from the lessons. Learn from how they hurt you. But burn what's left over. People will not always love you. But God will. That's the thing you need to remember. Sometimes people just simply will not love you. Now look at this. People will say, I love you. But love is a verb. Say that with me. Love is a verb. Love is an action. Agape love, the kind of love that we're called to, that Greek word, it means we love people when they're unlovable. We love people whether they can do anything for us or not. People will not always love you that way. They will love you as long as you can do something for them. They will love you as long as you please them. But sometimes the call of God will make you or lead you into places that people will not always love you. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, this is real love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice, say this with me, to take away our sins. Say it again. As a sacrifice to take away our sins. I left her on the riverbank. I gathered the fruit, and I burned the tree. When Christ died for us, the old life was done away with, and a new life has come. We're new creatures in Christ. Can we give him a hand of praise for that this morning? <laughs> Fourthly, people will let you down, but not everyone will, and that's important. People will let you down, but not everyone will. Look at 1 John 4, 6. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. This is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. You know, in preaching this gospel for 50 years, a little over 50 years now, I have so many life lessons. I have so many journals. I have so many stories Somebody asked me once, they says, how do you get so many stories? I says, live a long time. <laughs> live a long time and do something. If you've never sat with Dick Krug, Dick has got some of the most fascinating and wonderful stories. I, sometimes I just sit there and say, how could one man do so much in one life? I, I called on Ed a while ago, picking on Ed just a little bit, a few moments. Ed's got so many stories. Do you know in another country, Ed was a rebel at one time? And God got a hold of his life and did something. I mean, it's just a story of faith and love and what Christ did in their hearts. If you live long enough, there are stories to tell. You see, there will always be people that let you down. But I can tell you the people who stood by my side through the years can tell you of a congregation called Woodland that we've done life together. At one of the lowest points in my life, when I was so sick and just days away from death, a group of pastors and friends in Macon, Georgia, that I hadn't seen in years, called a prayer meeting and says, Pastor Dennis is sick. We're going to pray for him. I can barely remember it, but I, I remember the voices, but Becky laid the phone on the pillow beside my head in the hospital, and, and I remember Billy Thomas going, Pastor Clant, we're all gathered here, and we're praying for you tonight, and there was this din coming out, and the doctor who had just told us a week before I had less than two weeks to live came running up the stairs not long after that phone call. He said, I just had an idea. It will work, I think. It, will, it, says, it may not work, but we don't have anything to lose if you're willing to try it. And now that surgery is being used as a teaching surgery at major hospitals and major universities across the country. Video of the surgery done on this body that came as a result of God answering those prayers. 
people that had given up on me, people that when I was in the hospital told me they could not know any longer worship at Woodland because if I was a man of faith, I wouldn't be sick. I've never told some of this. Told me, because one man, that I had helped him get his job. I'd helped him get established and pray with him through some difficult things. And I've never preached anything like that in my life. And he called me up on the phone. And he says, you'll never see me at Woodland again because you're not a man of God. Because if you're a man of God, you wouldn't be sick. Somebody else came in and says, if you don't fire this staff member, I'm leaving the church. And I had tubes coming out of my mouth and my nose. And it says, then you'll have to leave the church because I'm not firing them. There will be people that will let you down, but not everyone will. And those that don't will stand by you. And if one can put to flight 1,000, two can put to flight 10,000. Somebody say amen this morning. Never forget those that are standing with you. So three things that I'd like to apply this to us is number one, there are people in our world being persecuted. Let's pray for persecuted believers Let's intercede for them. Let's secondly, let's learn from them. How are they so bold? How is it that they risk their lives to gather to worship? And sometimes if it's just not convenient, we don't gather to worship. How is it they are willing to give their very life? And sometimes we struggle to give our tithe. How is it where they're willing to lay everything on the altar? When in Saudi Arabia, they're offering over $10,000 rewards if you will tell them where there's a secret Bible meeting going on. And Christians are gathering with a price on their head. Thirdly, let's support world missions financially and prayerfully. So, Pastor, why would you put financially and prayerfully there? Because this is what I've learned in my short life. Look at me, don't miss this. People who give to missions pray for missions. People who give to Woodland Church pray for Woodland Church. When you give to something, you pray for its good success. And then finally, keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. I can't wait for Jesus to come back. I'm so eager for that. Every day my heart longs more and more. I, I don't know if you're like me, but some beautiful days I am driving down the highway and I look up in the sky and I say, Jesus, this is a good day to come back. Especially if I'm driving facing the east, knowing that the, that eastern sky could split open and we could be, those of us who are alive, those who have died in Christ will rise first and then we which are alive and remain will call up to meet the Lord in the air forever. I find myself just driving and saying, Maranatha, Maranatha, come quickly. Do you ever feel that in your heart? Jesus, come soon. He writes to young Timothy, he says, and now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Why is he, look at me now. Why is he telling Tim this? Why is he saying to this young pastor? Because he is reminding him of the prize that if we walk faithfully with the Lord, we'll be ready to meet the Lord when he comes again. Amy told me something the other day when I was going up the stairs and the doctors got me limited on coffee right now. Y'all have no idea what a burden that is. And so I said to Amy, I need another cup of coffee. She says, you can't have it whether you like it or not. <laughs> I want to tell you something. Jesus is coming whether you like it or not. And no amount of denying it is going to change that. He tells Titus, who's preaching and pastoring in a difficult culture, a culture that he says, these people, their gods are their bellies. He said, we look forward with hope in Titus 2.13. We look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. And then he says to Timothy in verse 7, Tim, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. Three things. The fact is, there's going to be a fight in life, so be sure your fight's the good fight. 
Fighting with my wife is not a good fight. Fighting with my children is not a good fight. Fighting with my neighbor is not a good fight. Fighting with you is not a good fight. But fighting for my wife, fighting for my children, fighting for my neighbor, fighting for our congregation, fighting for truth, that's a good fight. Can you say amen? Secondly, don't be indifferent. Finish the race. Don't sit on the sideline. Beth killed Dave before she moved to Grand Rapids. And Beth, as you know, is a hyper miler. She runs some races, physically runs some races that are over 200 miles long. And we're not talking about on flat land like in southeast Michigan, but in the mountains out west and in the Rockies. One day she was telling me a story that she and this other man were kind of running side by side. They came on another runner, and he was sitting on a rock, and he was sitting like this, and he was vomiting, and they, they, they stopped to see if they could help him, and he was recovering, and he goes, I think I'm going to quit. I think I'm just going to have to drop out, and this man that she was running with, he looked at him, he says, son, you can sit there and puke, or you can get up and finish this race. Don't be indifferent. Keep your eyes on the prize. Run this race to win it. Finish the race. And finally, stay true. Keep the faith. Not just a doctrinal faith, but keep your faith strong and warm. Because remember, God will stand with you. Somebody say amen this morning. God will stand with you. In Hebrews 13, 5, for God has said, I will never leave, fail you. I will never abandon you. Everybody else may. Paul said they did him, but not God. God will always be there. Don't fret over the unfairness of life. Don't fret over some, there's been some painful things that happened. It may be cancer. It may be death. It may be a divorce. It may be financial reversal. It may be the loss of job. It may be a hurricane in South Florida. It may be an earthquake in Nepal. You can spend time fretting over the unfairness of life, or you can keep your faith alive and real in Jesus. For God does make all things work out for the good of those who love him and for those that are called according to his purpose. Can somebody say amen to that? You've got to keep that faith. God will bring good out of your pain. But because God was so gracious in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, but because God was so gracious, very generous, here I am. Hallelujah. That's my testimony. That's why I'm behind this pulpit this morning. Because God was so gracious. It was God giving me the work to do and God giving me the energy to do it. Some of you, you need the strength and the energy of God, and he wants to release that in your life this morning. So why? Why leave it on the bank of the river? Why gather the fruit and burn the tree? Why pray may God not hold it against them? Because God is more interested in your future than he is your past. And if you won't be held captive by your past, and you will hold fast to your confession of faith, Christ for me, Christ with me, Christ above me, Christ around me, Christ coming again for me. My friends, you will bear a hundredfold fruit for the kingdom of God. Would you stand with me this morning? Heads bowed and eyes closed, please. Lord, it may appear sometimes like our lives are like a drink offering. And I'm just being honest, Lord, there are some people very difficult to like, sometimes very difficult to love. But you call us to love not only the lovely, but the unlovely. You call us to love our enemies. And frankly, Jesus, I can't do that without you. I can put on a mask, but you see my heart. 
And some of us, Lord, the past has got a hold on us. We're obsessing over it. And rather than gathering the fruit, Lord, we're trapped. And I ask you, in the name of Jesus, may we leave it there on the altar today and not take it home with us. Heal us of our wounds. Energize us with grace and forgiveness. Let us taste the sweet wine of freedom and liberty and joy that comes when we are like you and we can forgive. And Father, make us mindful that we are so blessed and that you stand with us like you did with Jeremiah like you did with Peter, like you did with Paul, you do with all of us today. So would you take whatever pain, whatever hurt, wherever you feel abandoned, and would you tell the Lord that right now? And then would you just say, Lord, I'm giving it to you. I don't want to take it home. Heal my memories, Lord. Let me take home the fruit. <laughs> Let me take home the lessons. But let me go home free today in the name of Jesus because I know you stand with me. And I don't want this to be weird, but would you just envision the Father putting his arm around your shoulders right now and pulling you close. Feel his strong arm around you. <laughs> and say this, my Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me today my daily bread. Forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, and may you go home knowing God is with you today, in Jesus' name. You're dismissed. joining us today for Woodland Church and our YouTube channel. I hope you'll take a moment, click that subscribe button, and also click the notifications bell so that you'll know when new things are posted. We're always putting new material up so that you can be a part of everything that's going on. We want to share those with you, and we hope that they will encourage you and strengthen you in your faith as you watch. You can also find out more about Woodland Church by going to our website at woodland.church. You can find out all about us and also upcoming events. Again, thank you for joining us today.